Hello, you're watching Kitco News. I'm Michelle McCory, and I am honored to welcome reality TV star Rick Harrison. He's an entrepreneur, the owner of America's favorite pawn shop, the Gold and Silver Pawn Shop in Las Vegas, as featured in the History Channel series Pawn Stars, and a man who loves precious metals. There's a reason my shop is called Gold and Silver. It's my two favorite things to buy. It's a big chunk of gold. You got approximately $24,000 worth of gold here? Wow. When you've been a pawnbroker as long as I have, you know real gold when you see it. Once you account for inflation, an ounce of gold buys you basically the same thing today as it did back then. The value really hasn't changed, just uh, our money's got worth a lot less. <laughs> <laughs> That's why they've been using gold as money for 6,000 years. I got these bars, and this thing alone is almost 75 pounds. Oh, that's cool. And all paper money was was a promise to pay you real money. Right. Silver is the best conductor of electricity there is. Um, I'll go 111,000 even. I'll go up 99 bucks. I've been collecting silver, son, for the past 30 years. Silver and gold is a hedge against hyperinflation. That is the deal. That is the deal indeed, Rick. Great to have you with us on Kitco. Well, thanks for having me. Well, Rick, you're well known as being a proponent of gold and silver and your late father had many pearls of wisdom and he would certainly advocate for holding gold and silver as a hedge against hyperinflation, as we saw in the clips there. Now, Rick, many of the top economists, investors are raising red flags over inflation. But the Fed is insisting that it is transitory, that it'll wane. Yet you have the likes of Mohamed al coming out expressing concerns that the Fed may be wrong. But yet we're still not really seeing this in the gold price. What do you make of that, that gold hasn't been moving on these concerns? I think eventually will. I mean, it's... Um... <sighs> You know, there, there's a million other investments out there nowadays, and um, you have people buying into the stock market, buying into Bitcoin and everything else like that. But eventually, they'll all turn back to gold and silver. I really, truly believe that. Um, we can't, I mean, um, the government's more or less gone insane with spending, um, and that is something that will catch up with us. It's um, happened, to, it's happened um, so many times during history, and um, generally, you know, right around 50 years as long as a... Uh, a currency lasts before it starts falling apart when there's nothing backing it. Um, I mean, just literally the price of just about everything is going through the roof. I mean, commodities across the board. I mean, like, uh, you know, I'm getting an addition to my house. The price of lumber is uh, quadrupled. The price of wire in my house has gone up. Um, you know, they're telling me that I uh, they can't get a new air conditioner. I mean, it's... Um, I see an inflationary spiral, especially when you're the government's incentivizing literally pay, not paying people not to work, which uh, like Biden even said the other day, um, is he wants to increase wages. I mean, it's basic economics. If you doubled the amount of money everybody made, everything in six months would be cost twice as much. And um, we have a lot of people in the government that just don't understand that. Rick, there is indeed concern that the helicopter money, the overstimulation from fiscal and monetary policies, is going to damage the economy. Larry Summers, for one, calling it the least responsible economic policies in 40 years. So given that, where do you see gold and silver prices going? What is your year-end outlook? I mean, I, I, mean, I think gold will probably go over $2,000 by the end of the year and um, silver over 30. Um, I mean, it's, you know, like I said, it's not really the price of gold. It's the decline in the value of the dollar. I mean, here recently, the dollar, was just, the dollar index was below 90 um and somehow or the other got pumped up but it's just i mean when you have three and a, three and a half uh trillion dollars in income and uh you have a government trying to spend seven or eight trillion dollars inflation is going to come there's no way to stop it modern modern monetary theory um is is just ridiculous um it really is um you know, and I, I think I mean, I've advocated this for years. I'm not saying put everything you have into it. I mean, it's an amazing insurance policy. Um, you have people out there saying that, um, you know, and I think Bitcoin is going to go somewhere. And I think NFTs are going to go somewhere exactly where I have no idea. Um, but when people say the government can never regulate like Bitcoin and stuff like that, um, I tell these people, yeah, you wore a mask for a year. The government can do what they want. <laughs> All right, well, 
We will uh, circle back to Bitcoins and NFTs in a minute, but I'm glad you touched on them and potential regulation. But in the meantime, you, you mentioned the, the jobless benefits and how it's keeping people away from applying for jobs. A lot of people are saying that's the problem, that people are simply being paid more to sit at home. Now, you have a thriving business, several of them, in fact. You interact with a lot of people, a vast spectrum. One could say that you have your finger on the pulse of the microeconomy in many ways. Are you picking up on any trends that you'd like to articulate in the post-COVID world? Um, well, the big trend is, is like, um, I literally was talking to a person yesterday. He has 12 fast food restaurants um, here and in Southern California. He's closing two of them, not because they're not making money, because he can't get an employee, hmm. any employees. Um, I mean, that's, I mean, that's, I've talked to so many business owners. That's a big thing right now. Um, they just can't get employees. People, you know, when you incentivize people not to work, they're not going to work. And um, that is really going to um, eat on the economy here soon. And like I said, it's just, it's just another inflationary factor. Yeah, well, on the upside, at least uh, from your perspective, Nevada is saying that the eligibility requirements for unemployment will go back to what they were pre-pandemic. That's a very recent announcement because you do get the sense that jobless benefits are keeping people away from working. But the people that are coming into the store and are coming to Vegas, do you get a sense that Vegas is back now, Rick, post-COVID? Is Vegas back, baby? Uh, it, it's getting back. It's very close. Uh, with me, you know, I'm on television in 100, 150 countries and 38 languages. Um, and um, right around 40% of my customers are from Europe and South America. And I'm not getting those crowds back at my store. Uh, they're beginning to trickle in. It seems to be a little bit better. But um, there's just something about Vegas and no one can replace us. So um, it's that kind of fun town. So right. I think it's all coming back. Um, it's just uh, not as fast as I'd like. Well, slowly but surely. In terms of demand for goods in your store, are you seeing increasing demand for gold and silver these days? Um, yes. I mean, like, um, it's... Very hard to keep any bullion stock in stock, and um, the bullion we do have. I mean, I'm selling it for like four or five dollars over spot when it comes to silver, because I just can't get it right now. It's very difficult to get. I mean, just physical silver is a very hard thing to find right now, and um, I know a lot of people in this business, and like every, people do retail in it. Physical delivery is very hard right now. Why? Why do you think that is? Uh, well, there's a big thing with the COVID and everything. The uh, U.S. government stopped making eagles for a while. They got really behind. Um, so there was a, a lag there. And, you know, all last year there was massive demand, physical demand. There's a lot of physical demand right now. And um, it's just whole supply chain issues. Um, that's why I'm just talking to a larger, large manufacturer. And uh, it's supply chain issues, just getting the silver from point A to point B to point C to get manufactured. Um it's just, it's not the way it used to be. Um, like you just get general delivery bars and go from there, but it's not that easy right now. Are you seeing a demand for any other type of good or collectible or item that's unusually high? There's a lot of free money out there. I and mean, as far as collectibles go, they're going crazy. I mean, I'm getting, I mean, I'm selling some video games for tens of thousands of dollars, just the cartridge. Wow. Um, the uh, I can't keep a Rolex in stock. I can't find any Rolexes. Usually, I mean, generally, there's tons of people out there that sell used Rolexes um, wholesale. I can't get any. Um, generally, the collectibles market in general is on fire. Is on fire, and it's um, if it's hot right now, it's uh, it's hot. You can't get it. But like I said, the video games are really huge right now. Uh, a lot of people are doing the NFTs. So, you know, I plan on getting into that market here soon, but. Uh, I still have to figure it out. So I'm hiring really smart people a lot smarter than me to figure it out for me. <laughs> well, well, I'm glad you mentioned NFTs because your business is all about tangible, valuable objects, people coming in with family heirlooms, items that they found in dusty attics or garage sales, priceless possessions, if you will, memorabilia, collectibles. And as you just mentioned, we're seeing this virtual world of NFTs, non-fungible tokens, which are for our viewers, unique tokens on the blockchain that can be anything from digital art to the image of a first tweet. And we're seeing that market completely explode. It's estimated to be over 
half a billion dollars already. We had the Beeple NFT selling for $69 million, a digital kitty sold for $170,000. I mean, it's, it's an explosive, exploding industry. A lot of it has to do with uh, potentially the, you know, the fact that we've got so much money out there in the system. So you do think that this is something you could go into? But there's other ways you have to look at it. Because um, we've sort of had, you know, it wasn't digital, but we've sort of had the non-fungible tokens before. I mean, like, you could take, um, you know, I've sold plenty of, uh, like, Picasso and Renoir lithographs for over $100,000. And um, that is actually just a, a numbered copy. Okay, I mean, a lithograph is just a copy of the, of the artist's work, you know, and the artist signed it. I mean, that, that was a copy on paper, whereas opposed to you get a copy, you know, basically on your phone. And um, just like a baseball card, you know, I mean, there's, they make thousands of them. Those are on paper. This is on your phone. I mean, that's basically the difference. And the younger people really look at if it's on my phone, it's real um, instead of a piece of paper that's real. Um, it's uh, like, you know. My, I, mean, I don't think my kids have ever written a check before. They just do everything online on their phone. It's just right. uh, they live around it. And the NFTs, um, I know it's way different, especially for an old guy like me. But the uh, you have to understand, I mean, we've been selling copies of stuff forever. Because that baseball card is just a copy of, you know, there's an original, there's an original print. You make a bunch of copies. They sell baseball cards. And years later, that... Base, that copy of that baseball card is worth a lot of money. Um, this right here is, uh, it's on your phone. Good thing about it is um, they don't get torn or messed up or the dog don't eat it. <laughs> so you do see NFTs then as the future of uh, fine collecting of memorabilia, of art? I think some of the stuff, that they, it's it's the Wild West out there. and People are paying a lot of money for some stuff. I think some stuff... Um, it's probably going to go really up. Some stuff I think has been, already been overpaid for, but um, I think it's a real thing. Um, and you know, you just you just have to realize, you know, like I mean, like I have a lot of weird stuff. I mean, um, like I said, I plan on eventually doing these NFTs. I mean, I have my own NASA rocket. Uh, my you own have NASA your rocket. own NASA rocket. My own NASA rocket engine. <laughs> All right. Well, you plan. If you're really into NASA, one? I mean. If, if you're really into space and like NASA and everything like that, most people can't afford their own um, actual rocket engine that was actually piloted by Neil Armstrong. Um, I have all that weird stuff, and I eventually start going to start doing the NFTs. I want to get all my ducks in a row first, make sure I do it right. So you are moving into the NFT space, right? That's some. Uh, I, I am moving in. It's just a few. I mean, I want to get everything right before I do it. Uh, I just want to dive right in. I just want to make sure um, I'm. A little scared about the the SEC, the law. I just want to make sure I'm doing everything right um, and um, before I dive into anything. Well, to your point, you mentioned clarity in regulation, and there is this idea that perhaps that is what is holding back the crypto sector to a degree that it is what may be slowing down the flow from big institutional money into Bitcoin. But nonetheless, the interest in Bitcoin has certainly been growing across the board. And some are saying that Bitcoin is, in fact, digital gold, and it's Bitcoin that's taking away from gold's luster as an inflation hedge, as a store of value asset. So, Rick, what are your views on Bitcoin? Do you have any Bitcoin? Have you taken the orange pill, so to speak? Um, I, I own some, and uh, I, own, I have money invested in companies that, that uh, are doing things with it. Um, I got more gold and silver than I do uh, crypto. <laughs> I mean, the fact of the matter is, I've always told people, like, if, put 5%, 10% of your savings in gold. I mean, it's insurance policy, okay? You never want gold to go to $100,000 an ounce because everything else will have collapsed. I mean, right. it is a true, I mean, I, I consider it a true store of value. Um, and other thing, I mean, crypto is very interesting, like I said, everything, but like, when you have all these, like the Dogecoin and all that, you know, that's gambling. There's, there's no store, of, like the Dogecoin, things like that. There's no store of value there. It's 100% gambling um, because no one buys these things just to, like when it comes to the cryptocurrencies, uh, as a store of value. I mean, it would be insane to buy these things as a store of value as the, since they go up and down. It's not really a currency. It's basically gambling. And um, I see a place for them, 
but I would really like to see the prices stabilized to something within the realm of normal. All right, so to recap, you like gold and silver ultimately as a hedge against inflation, keep about 10% of, of your portfolio there. I like your point that if you say gold goes to $100,000, something has gone terribly wrong in the system. <laughs> so that's, that's a good observation then. And then everything else is pretty much worthless anyway. But you also like Bitcoin and you're big into cryptos and you're potentially expanding into NFT. So you're clearly moving with, with the times there, Rick, yeah. which is which is very exciting. Now, one of the other things you're very well known for is being a master negotiator. People come into your shop, they have a number in mind. Somehow you always manage to knock them down a few. Any negotiating tips? Uh, my, my one negotiating tip I tell everybody, always be willing to walk away. Yeah, I mean, you just have to all be like, if the deal's not right, the deal's not right, well, walk away. I mean, because um, I've seen so many deals over the years that were like, they was so much, I mean, they just weren't willing to walk away. Okay. It's, it's the deal of the century. And it, like, like AT&T buying, you know, direct TV and things like that. I mean, like, why in the world did you, you should have just walked away from the deal. <laughs> All right. That's good advice. Always be willing to walk away. You're also known as the spotter. You're an acclaimed <laughs> expert when it comes to spotting anything fake or stolen. How do you do that? And does that like... Oh, I know, as far as the fake stuff, but, uh, you know, um, you know I, I've been in the pawn business my whole life and I've dealt with really expensive stuff my whole life. I mean, actually, I, just, I make sure something's real. It's pretty easy. I mean, um, everything from a Gucci purse, a Louis Vuitton purse to a Rolex to a Picasso. I mean, you basically just go on and check everything you have to check. And if everything's right, it's good, you know. You go, right, right, right. And the second there's something wrong, there's something wrong. <laughs> and you just, you go away from it. I mean, that's the one thing you tell how things are real. I mean, like uh, a piece of artwork is, uh, uh, is the, you know, if it's on paper, is the paper right? You know, is paper aged right? Is the, is, uh, you know, the media they used on it right for the time? Has it, is it aged properly? To, um, you know, uh, you know, the aging is, you know, it's really easy to tell for fake aging. I mean, you just have to go through that list in your head on every single thing that has to be right. And right. Um, if it's not right, it's, it's wrong. So it's more a thorough process than it is of going through a checklist than it is instinct for you. Or have you developed an instinct at this point to not only discern between objects, but also perhaps um, fake people, if you will? Um, no, I mean, um, you know, you sort of have an instinct for it, but you always check yourself because once you get, you know, you start getting really cocky, that's the day you're going to get burned, and it's happened to me before. Uh, um, so, <laughs> you know, it's really a process. You just go through, you know, a, make sure everything's done properly, and then you'll know. I mean, and, um, it's uh, never believe you know everything because they come up with a new way to fake things every day. I mean, I've seen fake everything. <laughs> stuff, you would never, stuff you would never would think would be fake. They fake. <laughs> All right, well, Rick, you've left us with a few uh, gold nuggets of wisdom over there. If it doesn't look right, it's probably wrong. And be willing to walk away. Well, we're going to have to walk away from this interview now. We do appreciate your time, though, so very, very much. Rick Harrison, thank you for joining us. And when can we expect the next season? Um, I start filming uh, season 18 uh, next month. And, um, you know, it's the one reason I think my show's always been real successful. It's always different. So, uh uh, we haven't really scheduled anything for next season yet, so um, hopefully it's going to be really different and fun. I know we're going to go to Europe and a few other things like that All if right. COVID's over. <laughs> uh, yeah, if, if travel is permitted. Rick, thank you so much. We will be watching. Thank you again for joining us, Rick Harrison. All right, bye-bye. And thanks for watching. Keep it right here.